Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another edition of Philosophy, where this time we're going to talk about Freedom Wars, aka Check Your Privilege, the game. Freedom Wars is an online multiplayer giant monster fight game, similar to games like the Monster Hunter series. It was developed by SCE Japan Studio along with Shift and Dimps. Now, personally, their previous title that I played, God's Eater Burst, was one of my favorites if not my favorite co game on the PSP. And from what I hear, for the PlayStation Vita, it's so far been the number one selling game in that console's lifespan. Unfortunately, being on the Vita, Freedom Wars hasn't gotten a lot of attention. But I think Freedom Wars is something that you really need to pay attention to. In this game, you play as what is called a sinner, which is basically what you can think of as a sort of slave or d indentured servant to the states in a dystopian future. Each state is called a panopticon. Literally, uh, the name for the state means Big Brother. We see everything. It is very heavy-handed with this dystopian uh, imagery. And what's really interesting about it is that so far it is the only work of fiction that I've ever encountered in which the government of a dystopian society actively recognize that it is dystopian but gives a great argument for why you should accept that. The way this situation came about is very different from other dystopian fiction as well in that it wasn't a result of some massive catastrophe that changed the operation of the world. It wasn't the result of gradual acceptance of political corruption. No, literally, the Earth straight up ran out of resources. It's just barren. And as a result, the only way to keep humanity alive, at least in this world's perspective, was to severely limit the states and send everyone underground and completely control the flow of resources and what this resulted in was a competition between the some 12 24 panopticons that made it even to surviving for what's left of those resources and resources become what define everything in this world so not only are food and water and technology considered resources but one's own personal knowledge is considered a resource owned by the state, a person's labor or manpower. In fact, even the person's life itself are completely minimized down to just being a resource and not much else. In the opening cutscene and first mission of the game, you start out as one of these sinners that has already made a very significant uh, progress into their career and you're competing with another group in order to get resources from one of these giant robots that one of the other panopticons has sent to steal from you. However, in the course of that, you end up in getting in an accident and you lose your memory. Well, guess what? Your memory is one of those resources owned by the state. By losing it, you've committed high treason. And the punishment for high treason? one million years in jail. The second half of the punishment is also that since you are basically a new person as far as the state is concerned and a completely blank resource, you have to buy back all of those privileges and those abilities that you had once earned because you haven't contributed anything to society yet. If you don't work, you don't eat and you also don't have the liberty to stand or sit or breathe or walk five steps or run or not be looked at or wear whatever clothes you want. You have no privileges. You must buy them. And every time you end up using a privilege, a license that you didn't earn, well, your sentence get increased by a few hundred more years. Now, something that is fairly new in modern philosophy is this idea of a distinction between freedoms and licenses. Sure, in the United States we call ourselves free, but in the end, no matter what we do, we are only allowed to do whatever is not expressly forbidden by the United States government, as is with most nations. 
For example, I have the freedom to roam here in the United States. I may travel wherever I wish, from state to state, by bike, walking, or car. Any means that I have available to me, I can go where I wish. But that right isn't universally assured. As another example, I have the freedom of speech. I may say whatever I wish. However, that freedom of speech is also not universal. I don't have a right to hate speech because hate speech has been found to limit the rights of other people in other sectors of society. I don't have the right to slander or libel in published work. All of these things, because they violate some other right, my right to speak freely must necessarily be limited, and the law reflects that. It is this understanding in law that every human or natural right has some degree of limiting factors because other people must share in those and all other rights equally at all times that gives rise to this distinction between freedom and licenses. It is theorized that any society is not in fact free. No matter what the government's form, freedom is just determined by the amount and the kind of licenses that the government gives to its citizens. Now back when the founding fathers were writing the first papers that would come to define the United States as a nation, the predominant ethical philosophy of the time was that of natural law. Rights are innate and undeniable. Because we are human, we have certain rights. And you can see this sentiment even in the Constitution when it states, We hold these truths to be self-evident that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But were the Founding Fathers right? Are our rights, our freedoms, actually undeniable? Or are they merely social convention? Or maybe some of what we've come to consider natural rights here in the United States are in fact merely a convention created by either our government or we as a society participating in it. When talking about freedom, there are two popular ways in discussing what is the right way to think about the concept of freedom. And those are defined as either thinking of it as freedom from or freedom to. The freedom from perspective is that freedom is made by having as few limitations on you as possible. Any limitation that exists is therefore a limitation on your freedom and makes you less free. For freedom to, it is seen as freedom to act, to be proactive. The more you have the ability to decide and to act means you are more free. While the two perspectives basically say the exact same thing, depending on which one you choose, it can play an extreme role in your general outlook on the concept, whereas freedom can sometimes be considered very scarce and stealable, that it can be destroyed at any moment, the other considers freedom something active, usable, like a tool. It's the difference between thinking of freedom as something that is limited, like a resource, or thinking of freedom as something active and creatable. In my personal opinion, when it comes to practicality, it's much better to look at freedom from the freedom to perspective. When you look at freedom as freedom from, the basic condition of being alive is going to limit your freedom in some way, and therefore you can never feel perfectly free. Just being human, happening to be born in the United States or anywhere else in the world, to think of the freedom from perspective, existing as we do as a three-dimensional being makes you less free. But for freedom too, you can actively decide how much freedom you have to act upon. You can choose it and you can make it. But at the same time, just because the freedom to perspective is more practical, does that mean it's really accurate? Freedom Wars definitely takes the perspective of freedom from and uses everything in a conceptualized context of resources to make that conception of freedom 
to be entirely commodified in the way we do with resources. I haven't finished the game yet, but I'm really excited to see the conclusion that we're working towards, because as you play through the game, your main character seems to be somehow resisting the establishment of the Panopticons in a way that everyone else just seems to tacitly accept. But at the same time, the argument for why the Panopticons need to exist seems fairly accurate, and the protagonist, at least in my story, has yet to really find a way to avert that or correct some mistake in the Panopticon's thinking. So I'm really excited to see where this game goes, and I'll probably be doing another episode in the future. Well, anyways, that's all I have for today, everyone. Thanks so much for coming and watching the video. I will definitely see you at the next discussion. And real quick, let me tag on the end of here just so I don't forget. I totally don't buy the whole freedom as licenses argument. Not yet. Just saying. Toodles. <laughs>